And thank you for having me here. It's such an honor to be here speaking um, to all of you. It's my first time in Colorado. Yay. Yeah. So, and thank you, yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you to Book Bar for being here tonight as well. I hope you all support your independent bookstores. They're so important to our communities and, and to our culture. And I actually spent a few days, sorry, not a few days, a few hours today at Book Bar, working at their, at their coffee bar. Um, so, you know, I'm gonna talk to you today a little bit about my book, a little bit about myself. And I'm gonna talk to you through the lens of story and how I understand story and, and what it sort of shows us about the world. Um, I feel like we understand the world, we understand our lives always through the medium of stories. And I'm gonna start off by talking to you about a story that my mother told me when I was a kid. So people often ask me, you know, how did you become a writer? Why are you a writer? And there's the standard answer of talking about getting an MFA, talking about my first, you know, short stories, that sort of thing. But I think that I was born as a writer when my mom told me this one story um, when I was five years old. And just as background, I was the youngest. I have two brothers who are 10 years and 11 years older than me. I was like really the baby of the house and no one told me anything. Um, like it, stuff was happening and I never got the real scoop. So I remember being in the back seat of my mom's car and she would tell me these stories sometimes. But this one day she told me the story of when she was five years old, um, standing outside her family home with her little sister who was two or three and their mother had just died and the two of them were standing together and watching their mother's body being carried to the funeral pyre for for cremation and you know this is it, it's this is a, a heartbreaking story it's a sad story for me at age five it was a fascinating story you know, to be told something about death as a five-year-old, you know, as a five-year-old in a, in a comfortable, secure situation, you're so protected from death. You're so protected from the darker elements of life um, or the more painful elements of life. And yet here was my mom telling me this, this real thing that had happened to her when, when no one told me anything ever. And this was such a gift. And I think it was my awakening as a writer because I, you know, I had to imagine, I imagined my mom in a little white dress and her little sister in a little white dress. I, I, I filled in all these details of, of men carrying the platform with, with my grandmother's body on it. I, I had these, you know, very visceral and, and dramatic visions of, of the fire of cremation. Um, and that was one of those moments that was just a step, but a very important step in me becoming a writer. So that story not only planted a seed in me, but it also gave my mother, in a, in a way, the freedom to immigrate. So she, she lost her, her own mother at age five. She then lost her father as a teenager. And she, um, you know, she was in a very vulnerable position. She was orphaned. But in that orphaned space, she also had the freedom to make her own story, to make the life that she was going to make. She didn't have the safety. She didn't have the security or the, the safety net of parents who were going to arrange her marriage for her, for her, who were going to tell her what she was to do with her life. So she forged her own path. And uh, she immigrated to the States, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. But just to, to talk for a second about immigration, I feel like immigration is the greatest story of all. When we think about the seven basic plot types, some of you might know this, Christopher Booker is a writer who designated seven basic plot types. And they are overcoming the monster, rags to riches, the quest, Voyage and Return, Comedy, Tragedy, 
and rebirth. And I think that immigration encompasses each and every one of these plot types. Immigration is all of those things. And with my own family's immigration story, I, I see that. So my parents met in medical school. Like I said, my, my mom had no one like arranging anything for her. She didn't have a dowry, she, she had none of that. But she did manage to get herself into medical school in Chennai, in India. Um, and she met my dad there. Uh, it was, I think, a mutual family friend who took, who visited my dad when he was home for the holidays and was like, oh, you know, Surabi is, she's at, um, she's at medical school in Chennai now. She might want to see your books that you used last year because you're a year ahead of her. And so my dad very dutifully like took his first year books and took his little bicycle and, and cycled over to, to see my mom and give her the books, totally, probably just completely oblivious to, to what was happening to him. Um, <clears throat> but he met my mom, and then, a, you know, a, a courtship of a few years ensued, and my dad then graduated from medical school a, a year before my mother, and it was 1965, and this was the year that the U.S. was implementing their Medicare system, and they needed foreign medical graduates to populate their hospitals. And so they were recruiting people, like my dad, and, and he took a test, um, he passed it, and he decided he was gonna go to America to be trained and, and be a doctor here. And he asked my mother at that point to marry him. Now my mother still had a year of medical school left, but she said yes. You know, this was her life, this was her story to tell. So she said yes, and she married him, and they left a few weeks later. They were in Albany, New York in 1965. Now, my dad, from what I, you know, he's, he's alive and well, he lives in Berkeley, so does my mom. Um, from what I remember of him as a child, he, to me, looking back, was so quintessentially American. Um, he, at some point, he had a Porsche. <laughs> uh, he used to eat steak. He doesn't anymore, but he used to eat steak. We would go camping. Um, it's rumored that he had a Playboy subscription at some point, <laughs> which I don't like to think about, but you know, it was the 70s. Um, and, and so he really, he really embraced the American life. He, did, he didn't question it. Um, my mom, just to, to wrap up her story, so she came over here with him. She uh, had my two brothers um, right, almost right away, almost one after the other, and decided at that point that she had to go back to India and finish medical school. And so she took my two brothers, they were nine months old and like two years old, and took them back to India. And she dropped them off at my parents' family's house and went back to medical school and finished that last year. And she would take a, a bus home and, and see her kids every, every weekend. And she managed it, she finished it. And um, the, way I, the way I think about that now in the context of, of where our country is now is that I look at what my mom was able to do. She was able to come here, live securely with my dad. You know, they had an apartment, they had a, a training position waiting for my dad in Albany. They were able to have a safe and secure and workable path to being residents of the United States. And my mom was able to leave, finish her medical school, and know that she could come back and, and continue life in the US, and so she had that opportunity. Um, and eventually, you know, they, they finished all their training and they, they ended up in Sacramento, California, where I was born, and they, they hung up their sign and started an office. My mom was a pediatrician, my, mom, my dad was a urologist, and um, that was an interesting waiting room, <laughs> but you know. 
One thing I remember my mom saying as a doctor um, is that she never turned away welfare patients. She, uh, she had a lot of colleagues who did, who didn't take patients who were on welfare. And the way she saw it, she would always tell me, is that, that you know, children are not on welfare. Children are children. They're, they're, they're in need of health care. Um, and there's no... She, she couldn't justify in her mind turning away a family that needed health care because they were on welfare. Um, she had known poverty. She had known what it was to be vulnerable. Um, and I think about her also in, in terms of my book, in terms of Lucky Boy. So for those of you who've read it, you know that one of my main characters is Soli. Soli is a young woman from Mexico. She's um, new to the country. She's, she's migrated without papers, and she is in Berkeley, California. And she starts off as a house cleaner, and she be becomes a nanny to a Berkeley family. So like my mom, you know, she made a living taking care of the, ch the child of another family. Um, li like so many women I see in Berkeley, she devotes her life, she devotes her hours, her, her waking days, to caring for and loving the, the child of other parents. Um, but unlike my mom, she doesn't have the security of knowing that she's a documented immigrant. She doesn't have the opportunities that my parents had to set secure foundations to invest, to buy property, to create a stable American life for themselves and for their children. And I thought about this a lot, writing Lucky Boy. Um, and just to talk a little bit about the process of writing the book. So I initially heard about a woman on NPR. This woman's name was Encarnacion Bail. She was Guatemalan and living in the Midwest. And um, her son was being adopted away from her. This is what the NPR news story was about. Her son was being adopted away from her by an American couple when she was put in detention. And this was me in, in 2010, sitting in my car, you know, outside the house, like listening to this story, sort of dumbstruck by what was happening to this woman. Um, and because I was a fiction writer, I wanted to know, I wanted to know the story. I wanted to know the characters. Um, I wanted to know what those people were saying to each other, both the Guatemalan mother and the American parents who were adopting her child away from her. Um, I really wanted to get into the spirit of that story. Um, so here's what I did. You know, I, I, I started researching. I learned very quickly that this was not an isolated case. Um, Encarnacion Bail was, she was in the news, but there were so many other parents who were in detention and losing custody of their children through the foster care system and through adoption. And um, just to talk to you about some of the research that I did, because uh, I knew nothing. You know, I was, I was a writer. I, I, I knew what it was like to live in Berkeley. That's like the one aspect of my book that I knew about. And what it was like to be at an Indian wedding. You know, that, those are like my two areas of expertise. Um, so everything I didn't know about, I didn't know about immigration policy. I knew nothing about it. I didn't know how immigrants who don't have papers manage to get over the border. I didn't know what that looked like. Um, I didn't know what happens to an immigrant when they come in contact with, with the authorities or when they're put in detention. Um, so I, I spoke to everyone who would speak to me. I spoke to immigration policy experts. I spoke to immigration lawyers. I spoke to a um, policy scholar who specifically had just written a report on families or parents in detention and how it is exactly that they lose custody of their children. I spoke to a psychologist who works with undocumented immigrants. I did all the reading I could. I watched all the documentaries that I could and I got to interview a couple people who were undocumented themselves. And finally, and I think this was the biggest gift to this book, was I got to go to Mexico. 
So I had started writing this book. You know, I had created Soli as my character. I had sort of put her through the first steps of her journey. Um, but for a long time, for maybe the first six months to a year of writing, I was feeling like a fraud. I was feeling f like I was creating something fake, like I was not, I was not doing this book justice. And finally, I got this opportunity to go to Oaxaca um, and stay in a little town outside of the main city and kind of just be there. You know, I spent my days writing and walking around and going into the main city. I went to a village festival. Um, I talked to people. And one of the, you know, it, the greatest gift of that experience was that I was able to understand, um, or, or understand partially at least, a place that could be Soli's home. And, you know, I, I wrote down lists and lists of physical details of the place just to, like, try to create the texture of a real place um, in my fictional story. And looking back, it was so important to me, finally, to, to be in a place that could be Soli's home because I had been thinking of her in my space. I had been thinking of her in the American space. And that's what we so often do. We so often think of immigrants in our space, and it's easy to forget that they've, they've left behind a home. They've left behind families and full lives. Um, so once I got to Mexico and, and had that experience, Soli became real to me in a new way. And her home became real to me in a new way. Um, and I continued to ask myself, and, and probably still continue to ask myself, if I had the right to tell the story. Because I'm not undocumented, I'm not Mexican, and here I was, you know, in my comfortable room, at my comfortable desk, writing the story of a woman whose experiences reflect the real struggles that real people go through. So I really had to examine myself and ask myself what I was doing and why and where my storytelling um, acted as solidarity and where it was in danger of verging into exploitation. So the way I handled that was I, um, first of all, you know, I, I knew I was doing this research. I pledged to make Soli a, a fully fleshed out character, um, to build her slowly and carefully and I knew everything that I didn't know about her. I knew all the gaps in my knowledge. And at that point, I had to plug into what I did know about this character. What I did know about her was what it was like to be a, a young woman who wanted a bigger life than the life that she had. I knew what it was like to, um, to be a new mother, to be pregnant, to be awake with a newborn baby those first nights, those first sleepless nights, and those nights when the baby's perfectly asleep, but you as the mother wake up to, to make sure that, that he's breathing and, and you know, half disbelieving that you could keep this creature alive. Um, I, re I related to her on those points and on so many other points, so I knew solely better than I thought that I did. And I also knew that I was bringing this other angle into the story. So it wasn't just Soli's story. It was also the story of Kavya and Rishi. So Kavya and Rishi are a, um, an Indian American couple who live in Berkeley. They're, they're fairly affluent, fairly comfortable. They, they own their own home, which in Berkeley is, is kind of a miracle for anyone, really. Um, and by bringing that duality to the story, I, I felt like I was bringing my own knowledge to it in a new way. I, I was contributing something new to the discourse around immigration rather than sort of dredging up hackneyed old stereotypes or, or exploiting someone else's story who, whose story had nothing to do with my own. Um, and most of all, this story burned inside me. I had to write this story. And I knew that, and I think that's why I was able to put in the work and the time that I did. 
um, thinking about Kavya and Rishi, there were things I didn't know about them. Sure, they were, they were Indian American and they lived in Berkeley, but they were struggling to get pregnant. And that's something that I never had to deal with. Um, and the way that I sort of related to them in, in that sense was actually to think about my book and trying to get my book published. Um, it's not the same thing. The, I, could, I could never equate you know, wanting to get a book published with wanting to have a baby, but they're analogous emotions, working so hard for something, feeling like you're doing everything right, and having your body or having the publishing industry just not cooperate, just not do what, what they're supposed to do. Um, so this was me. This was me in 2013. I had finished a draft, uh, a couple drafts. I, I, I had a good book, um, and I had a great plan. My plan was that I was gonna uh, finish up this book, give it to my agent, get pregnant, and then my agent was gonna sell the book. I would get a book deal, and then I'd give birth, and then I would you know, take care of my newborn and get ready for my book tour and then go on my book tour. And it was all like nicely laid out, um, but it didn't work that way. So what happened was I, I finished what I thought was a finished draft of my book and I gave it to my agent. Um, I got pregnant, that was great. And uh, my agent sent it out and I got just a resounding round of, of no's. So rejections from, from almost, from basically everyone she sent it out to, um, which was not part of my plan. <laughs> so I pushed on and I actually ended up, we're not gonna talk about the ending, but I, I ended up flipping the ending, reversing the ending. Um, I made some major changes to the book. Um, it's kind of crazy. I decided to completely reverse my ending two weeks before I gave birth to my second son. And um, so I worked really hard for a week and then I had the baby. <laughs> and I think, I, I think when he was about three weeks old, I handed him to someone. I don't even remember who. I was in such a fog. Um, I handed him probably to my husband and rushed off to a cafe to try to fix this book. And that was me for a good year or two. We did another round of um, submissions to more publishers and I got more rejections. And then I, um, I submitted the book to this contest. Uh, Penn America runs a contest and I was like, this is gonna win. This is absolutely gonna win this, this contest. And of course, it didn't win the contest. It wasn't even a finalist. Um, so at that point, I was utterly, utterly despondent. This must have been 2015. And what I did at this point, and I, I always talk to writers about this because I think it's so important. I turned to my community, my writing community. So I'm part of this writers group in San Francisco. There are about 300 people on the email list. And I sent this tearful, sort of devastated email to the entire 300 person email list saying, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with my book? Why is it not getting published? And um, what I got in return was an outpouring from a lot of people I hadn't even met before. People sympathizing with me, people talking about books that they had given up on, um, people giving me advice, people calling me, people taking me to lunch. And it, there, it was this outpouring of support that almost felt like it had solved my problems for me. It hadn't quite solved the problem, but it gave me the, the last boost of energy that I needed. So I went back to my book. Um, I hadn't looked at it for about nine months, which is another good piece of writing advice. If, you know, if things are not happening, like put that book away, go back to it later. Um, I knew that I would not give up on this book, though, because it was not just me on the cover, uh, or, you know, the author was not just me. There was so much knowledge and generosity from other people who had shared their life's work with me. Um, I couldn't give up. So I, I took this final summer, I think it was the summer of, oh, 2015, and I 
went back to the book, I shuffled around some of the chronology, I studied how Toni Morrison had done that with Beloved. Um, I got rid of a character, I added a character. The whole Silicon Valley element was a very late addition. I, I added it that summer. Um, and I, I, I think I made it a book that was more about the West today and what, what immigration looks like in the West today rather than just Soli's story and Kavya's story. So I simultaneously made it a bigger book and a tighter book. Um, and I think that that's the difference that, that I made that final summer. So I gave it to my agent in the fall. And by January of 2016, I finally, finally had a few offers for a, a book deal. And that felt great. Um, but you know, there was so much work and rejection that went into this. And I, I tell myself, and I believe it, that the rejection and the failure is what made this a better book than it would have been you know, three years earlier. Um, this is a timely book. You know, this is said over and over again, and it's true. So I'm constantly having to rethink the conversation that my book is having with the world around it. And we all know now, you know, America and American immigration and the face of that is constantly changing. Most recently, we hear news of a migrant caravan that's coming up through Mexico. Um, and there's nothing inherently menacing about a caravan of migrants. And yet, somehow, that term has, has taken on a, a feeling of menace. And we have federal troops heading to the border as if we have an invading army. This is an invading army of children and mothers and fathers and people who've been walking for weeks, for maybe months, People who are weak, who are, who are hungry, who, you know, who are not going to hurt us. They're not here to hurt us. We don't need to send our troops down there unless our troops are planning to help them. Um, so this is what I've been thinking about a lot in the last week or two. I've also been thinking about what it's like to be a person of color in America right now. Um, you know, I grew up feeling pretty safe pretty secure. I, you know, I, I grew up in Sacramento, and we knew that there were sort of white supremacist groups on the outskirts of Sacramento, but they never entered my consciousness. They, they were not something that I worried about. Um, now and then, there would be a, a racist or anti-Semitic incident, and we would, feel, um, we would feel terrible about it, but we never felt the need to do anything about it because we felt safe. Um, I don't feel so safe anymore. You know, I'm, I have biracial children, and I know that there are increasing numbers of people in this country who see my biracial children as an abomination of sorts. Um, I, I hear about attacks on synagogues, and I think about my parents who are very devoted to their, their Hindu temple. And I think about the synagogues near me, and I think about anyone who is practicing a religion or a cultural practice that lies outside of the mainstream. And I worry for them. Um, and I ask myself, how did we become this way? I've been in this country more or less since my birth. Like, how, what happened? Um, I used to say, even, even a year ago on book tour, I would say that I don't think America is a country that hates immigrants. We're not an anti-immigrant country. We don't believe that immigrants are, are the enemy or criminal or bad. But I've stopped saying that because I don't think that that's the point anymore. I don't think the point is to think about what America believes. I think the point now is to think about what Americans are willing to do to preserve our ideals as Americans. We have been very passively 
um, resting on these beautiful ideals we have, these ideals of acceptance, these ideals of religious freedom, these ideals of getting to be who you are without persecution in this country, and ideals of opportunity and being open to newcomers, being open to people from poor countries, people who, you know, who, who don't have graduate degrees. Um, and I see those ideals being emptied because we've been passively enjoying them for so long. And don't get me wrong, I, I come across compassionate individuals every day. America is filled with compassionate individuals, people who give their time and their energy and their money to lift other people up. What I think we're missing now is compassionate institutions. I think we've lost that. Um, I think we need to bring back institutionalized compassion. And you know, I don't pretend to be a policy scholar. I don't pretend to be um, well-versed in, in law. But I'm speaking as a human. I'm speaking as a writer and an artist and a human being who's been living in America for the past 42 years, 41 years. Um, uh, and I think we live in a noble country, but we're in danger of, of losing that. And I don't want to see that go. Going back to story, America is a story that we've told ourselves for centuries. It's a story that we still tell ourselves. My question to you is if you were the authors of this story, and all of you are, if you were the authors, how would you have this story end? And what will you do to make your ending come to fruition? I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much. We're going to open the floor up for some questions now. So we've got just under 20 minutes for questions. There are microphones at each aisle here. So please just make a line and come to the front to ask any questions. Hello. Thank Hi. you for being here. Thank you. Um, as teachers, we tell our students, don't fall in love with your first draft. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we often fight them on is the editing process. How do you deal with your agent, your editor, other publishers? suggesting ways to change your book and are you how did you become open to not falling in love with your first draft yeah um so i think this is a, a mark of maturity as a writer i remember when i first started writing in my early 20s i was in love with everything i wrote i thought it was brilliant um, <laughs> uh, it really wasn't um, but I couldn't see it because I didn't have the tools mm -hmm. to, to see, you know, how, how you form character or, or when a sentence has too many adjectives. Um, I, I just couldn't see that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some of that is about learning craft, learning about, you know, tools of description and, and what one should do um, when, when writing, when editing. And you know when I when I have my novels and I have editors go at them, I, I still experience what your students mm -hmm. are feeling. There, with Lucky Boy, there was a time when I felt like my editor was cutting every sentence that I loved, mm -hmm. um, and some of it I had to accept was dead weight. It was beautiful, but it was dead weight. It was beautiful dead weight. Um, <laughs> so, in some, you know, when you get to the professional stage, you sometimes have to blindly trust mm -hmm. what your editor wants. Um, there were a couple things that I definitely stood by on and, and wouldn't give in on, and, and I'm glad for that. Um, yeah, so, you know, for your students, I would, I guess I'd be patient with them and let them know that, that there are tools that they can learn that will allow them to see what is working on the page and what is not and then just be patient. 
thank you so much. Sure, thank you. Hi. Hi. I really, I love the book. Um, and I don't want to give away too much of the book, but um, when you um, were talking about that you, a lot of the immigration things that you had researched, I was curious, the part where she escapes from the detention center. Yeah, we like can't the, talk about that. No, but the way she, but the way she did that was yeah. that factual that you knew that that's, like um, that no one would come looking for her? Was that, or was that just part of the story to make it kind of continue on? Uh, well, you know, no, it, it, so this is the, the thing with the American detention system. Um, there's so little consistency in detention centers, and there's, there's tracking of identities. Like, like we know, the, the, the government know, knows who is in detention, but it's also possible to, to disappear. I know, you know, speaking to the policy scholar that I was speaking to, he told me about a woman who um, escaped detention and was never heard from again. So anything can happen. You know, this is America, anything can happen, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm curious, I can't, I loved the book as well, mm -hmm. but I, and I can't remember her name, but um, the friend of the Indian woman. Oh, Preeti? Yes. Preeti Patel. I, yeah. I think just as I was reading her and, and their relationship, if there's other, without giving too much away, but any other like insight or, or thoughts around that or kind of the purpose of her, I think that's kind mm. of what I'm wondering of the friend. Okay, so Preeti Patel is an interesting character. She's kind of modeled on a girl that I grew up with. Um, <laughs> There's this girl named Raga Ramachandran who, um, what, she was the first Indian to win the National Spelling Bee. Um, now it's like every year, but, uh, so she grew up with me. We were good friends with her and her, her family, and she's actually really lovely. She's just a wonderful person, but she was one of these people who just she did it all. She was amazing. Um, and in the book, Kavya has a friend. She's kind of a frenemy to Kavya in the book. Um, and I guess I wanted to give her, from a writerly perspective, I wanted to give her someone to, to kind of bounce off of, um, kind of a, a, a foil in a way. Um, so you have Kavya, and, and when you have a friend, a, a friend like Preeti especially, you're able to highlight um, I was able to highlight Kavya's insecurities, her, you know, how she sort of stood in the eyes of her mother, in the eyes of the community. Um, Preeti was like the control group. She was like everything that you could do perfectly well. And, and Kavya was, was kind of a mess in, in, a, in a very lovable way. Um, and I also wanted to show, you know, Kavya's community is, is very much like mine. They, they expect excellence from their children, but they, they're also very accepting. You know, the, the, there's room to be yourself in the community that I grew up in. I go back and I did not take the path that anyone really expected for me. Um, I wasn't a doctor, an engineer. Uh, I didn't take these. Th I didn't take the predictable path, and yet when I go back home, you know, I, there are three or four sets of parents who are they're like my parents, and they, there's this sort of love, this the, this quiet, accepting affection that I feel for them, and I wanted. Um, we, we don't see that so much in Kavya's world because we don't go too deeply into her world, uh, or into her, you know, her parents' world, um, but. Yeah, but, but it's, it was there in the back of my mind, for sure. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Yeah. And before I ask my question, I just hope everybody votes on Tuesday. Yes, please vote. <laughs> or before then. Yeah. Um, I always find it interesting the titles authors choose for their books. And I'm curious, as part of your editing process, if this was the original title, were there iterations, and how did you choose the title? Um, so it's, this, is, this is not the first title by any means. Um, I went through maybe four or five titles and some of them were okay, some of them were really bad. Probably the worst, so it, the, the little boy in the book, his name is um, Ignacio and a nickname for Ignacio is Nacho. 
Um, so at some point, the title was Nacho! Exclamation <laughs> mark, Which is like the worst. It's just the worst. Um, but Lucky Boy was the title that I settled on. Um, for one thing, I like the ring of it. I, I like the sound of it. It has sort of a... It has an optimistic ring to it, not just in its meaning, but that, that L and the C and the B, like those are, those are happy sounds. Um, and the meaning, you know, it's kind of a double-edged meaning. So Ignacio is lucky in some ways because he was born in the US. And to me, that's a stroke of luck. It's not, it's not a stroke of virtue, but of luck. And, um, Lucky because he had two women who both wanted to be mothers to him, who both loved him. But also not so lucky because, because of this love, his fate was thrown to the wind. We, didn't, we don't really know what's going to happen for him. So, yeah. So I was fortunate to discover your book through the Tournament of Books that's presented oh, right. by the Morning yeah, News. Yeah, the Rooster kind of a, Awards. Yeah, yeah, it's an offbeat uh, book contest that uh -huh. the Morning News puts on. Um, but I enjoyed reading it. Thank you. Thanks. But I'm curious what you're working on currently. What does your next project look like? So I have a couple things going. One of them was um, an adult novel, which was pretty different from this one. I'm still working on it, but I had been working on it for a year and a half and felt kind of torture, tortured by it. I hadn't really gotten into the groove of it. Um, I think with fiction, with adult fiction especially, you really need some mental quiet. You really need some mental space. And with everything going on in my life, in the world, I just don't have that mental quiet right now. Um, and so I started a children's novel, a middle grade novel. And um, I, started that about a month or so ago, and it's really fun, and I'm really enjoying it. And it's kind of like, do you guys know the Mysterious Benedict Society or Harry Potter? It's, um, it's kind of like one of those books meets immigration policy. <laughs> but, so it's like, it's like a kid save the day sort of thing. Um, but it's also a look at the current immigration moment, but in, in an uplifting, adventurous kid way. touched a bit on um, parenthood and the mothers in mm -hmm. the book. Um, so <laughs> I'll just call her the crazy mother in Berkeley. Oh yeah, Mrs. Was, Cassidy. She yeah. was um, just <laughs> nuts. So yeah. could you talk a little bit about her? But also I thought that your view of fatherhood mm. was um, really compelling and um, touching. And so I thought that Rithi was, Rithi? Yes. Rishi. Rishi, yeah. sorry, it's been a while. Um, I thought that he was one of the best characters that you wrote. And so I was wondering if this is not too personal, what the model was for um, the father. For the father. The, okay, yeah. yeah. So Rishi, he was probably one of the hardest characters to write because um, for Kavya and Soli, their, their compulsions were very clear to me. Their, their impulses were very clear. They wanted to, they wanted their, their boy. They wanted to be mothers. Um, Rishi had to fall in love with Ignacio. He had to want to be his his father, but it wasn't such an obvious path to have him do that. Um, so I had to kind of figure out how to build that love gradually. And it came in the end from, from realizing that Ignacio needed him. Um, Rishi, you know, I, I talk about this in the book, Rishi and Kavya have a great relationship, but, but Rishi has never felt needed by his wife. He's always felt like a companion to her, but never, never like she needed him the way that she needed Ignacio. Um, and so when, when he saw that need in this little boy, that's what allowed him to, to fall in love with him. So I, I wrote Rishi, you know, it, it took me a while to get to that realization. It probably took me years of trying to write his character to, to realize that. And in terms of what he's like, um, I wanted him, I initially wanted him to be extremely charismatic. I saw, I was at the eye doctor once and I saw this guy at the counter and he just seemed like such a carnival of a person. I wanted to be friends with him. He was like this big goofy guy with like a, a big baseball hat on and, and glasses and like hair down to here. Um, 
and there's something about him. I wanted to be his friend. And I, I envisioned this for Rishi, a, an extremely social and charismatic person. But when I wrote him, when, when he found life on the page, he wasn't at all like that. So I kept saying on the page that he was like that, but then his actions and his personality were not bearing that out. So I kind of had to accept him as he was, as this, this quieter, kind of diffident, a little awkward um, tech guy. So, so I, I had to accept him in that way. And his job is actually modeled on my husband's job. So I, I sat my husband down and made him tell me everything and um, had him check some of the technology stuff and bounced ideas off him. My husband works in uh, energy efficiency in buildings, just like Rishi. Hello. This is an awesome book. Thank you. Um, so sometimes here in Broomfield, it feels like we can be void of culture and conflict. And I would like to know, as a person reading this book, I found a lot of things I could relate to. And I'd like to know, A, who did you imagine your audience to be? And B, what's the call to action? Ooh, OK. Who do I imagine my audience to be? Um, you know, I, I guess I imagine my audience to be people who want to know something about the state of their country or, or want one person's viewpoint into what's happening in America these days. Um, and I, I set my book in Berkeley because it's, it's such a diverse place and we have so many different types of people coming up against each other constantly every day. Um, so this book would be for someone who's, who's interested in seeing that. Um, this is not the book about the wealthy family on the Upper East Side of New York. You know, it's, it's not that book. It's very much about the collision of cultures and the collision of intentions. Um, so anyone who's interested in that, I guess. And in terms of the call to action, um, that's an interesting question for a novel because a novel at its core is meant to entertain. It's meant to abs absorb a reader and tell the reader a story in the very old-fashioned way we used to do around, around campfires. Um, but, but more and more, there's, you know, there's a call for novels, for fiction, to make a call to action. Um, I know that the readership, not just in Broomfield, but, but everywhere, I know the readership is, is politically diverse. Um, so I wouldn't want my novel to preach to anyone about what they're supposed to think. What I would call my readers to do would, would be to deeply consider both sides of the story and to consider the ground situation that brought my characters into the difficult situation that they were brought to. So really the call to action is to think deeply about what's happening. That is all the time we have for questions. Great. So we will have um, book signing and book sales in the lobby. And let's have one more round of applause for Shanti Sekhar. Thank you so much. <laughs>